This is a light module out of a fridge, and it was sent to me by a chap called Mike who'd bought a fridge, and not long after he'd got it, the LED module in it failed, and the service engineer came out under warranty and changed the LED module and said it was a fairly common failure. Now, in the past, they'd have traditionally just mounted a traditional small Edison screw socket, and you'd have got a, a tungsten lamp with it, and uh, it would have screwed in the standard fridge lamp. And I'm wondering if... Uh, I wonder what the main motivation for changing to a, a circuit board like this is. I'm guessing it's cheapness, because it means they don't need a socket. It means that there's less time terminating it. It also means that um, it takes much less space. It's much lower profile than equivalents of LED lamp. And when it goes in, uh, all they need to do is the wiring loom comes in. It goes to two crimp terminals on a connector. And I'm guessing from the clearance of these tracks that unless there's plastic washers or plastic screws that this might just clip in and then just connect and that's it. So it will save a lot of time in manufacturing. It also means that when it fails that you're not going to be able to just get a replacement and screw it in. You're going to have to get one of these boards or fix this one, which is unlikely, uh, if for your average person. Not us, of course. Um, and that's probably going to be... Because it's a proprietary component, it's going to be an astronomical expense, as these things are. So, um, the problems that are like to occur with this, I'm, I was expecting to see the black spot of death, but having said that, keep in mind, this is a, this is an appliance light. It's, when you open the fridge door, it lights up. When you close the fridge door, it goes out, and it's very cold in there. So, the LEDs are not going to, although they're going to be run quite a low temperature in the region of about 5 degrees Celsius or something like that, they aren't really going to be uh, pushed thermally. So um, I wonder what's actually failed in this. Uh, so the circuit diagram, uh, I've already taken a picture of this and printed it off so you can actually see what the actual the circuit board looks like. We've got the main terminal come in here. Uh, it goes straight through, but I'll actually draw this out in fact. I'll draw this, that's a good idea isn't it? So the mains comes in. Now, it's worth mentioning, you know, even before LED, LEDs, they had tungsten lamps with spade connectors in the back. And, you know, again, it probably saved them money to make it the uh, product that way. But uh, ultimately, when you go looking for a spare component, to get one of these tungsten lamps for, say, a microwave with the spade connectors on it costs an arm and a leg. It's, you know, it must, there must be an element of wanting to actually create a market for aftermarket components, spares. So, in the case of this one, we've got the mains come in, and one lead goes straight to this bridge rectifier here. So, one lead literally goes like that, whoop, over to that bridge rectifier. So, let's uh, draw the bridge rectifier in. Full bridge rectifier, which has four diodes in it, effectively. It's got two AC inputs, and it puts out rectified AC into uh, DC. The other connection, here... Uh, goes initially, it goes across like that, and then through a resistor. Now, there's a position for a surface mount resistor here, but they've actually used a sort of metal film resistor, which is the colour code brown, red, brown. And brown, red, brown means 1, 2, 1, which actually means 1, 2 and 1, 0, so it's 120 ohms. So the first component uh, is a 120 ohm resistor. The next thing after that is that goes through that resistor, and then it goes, I'm looking at the tracks here, it looks as though it goes across like that and then up to that end of the capacitor. So it goes to the capacitor, which is predictable enough. And the other end of the capacitor comes back down, um, diverts off here and goes over to the bridge rectifier. So, right, so that end goes to the bridge rectifier and the capacitor value, it's this uh, X2 suppression capacitor they used, and it's 474K, it's a 470 nano. And being an X2, it will be rated for, and certainly in the UK, it will be rated for around about, um, probably about 275 volts, typically AC, which is going to give a peak. Usually these are rated 275 volts AC, but you up to about 630 volts DC. Um, they are designed uh, for putting across uh, mains, Incoming supplies is a suppression capacitor, but it's useful in this application. There's also, if I join this track down here, it goes down to these two surface mount resistors, which each has a value of 470k. So we've got two 470k resistors in series for the voltage rating. 
2 times 470k and there the discharge resistors for that capacitor. Not actually that critical in this instance, unless, you know, apart from if you're taking the module out, you could get a zap off the capacitor. But um, in, in the fridge, you know, if you uh, disconnect it, there's always going to be some small load in the fridge that would actually have uh, discharged that. The output then goes to not just the LEDs, but it actually goes through, uh, via this capacitor, this discharge resistor, or uh, clamping down resistor. I mean, it really is just based on a standard lamp. The oddity here is a zener diode and then a 100 ohm resistor, and then up here is an electrolytic capacitor. So let's draw this out. We've got um, a small decoupling capacitor, this thing down here, tiny little thing. Um, not sure the value is, can't really measure it in circuit. Then we've got a resistor which will provide a slight load. Uh, it's one of these things that this resistor I'd normally associate with um, clamping down any slight leakage current so the lamp doesn't glow. It's the sort of thing that if you had it in a lamp like, say for instance this, it would stop it glowing when you had it switched off at the wall with a slight leakage because you know how sensitive LEDs are. But in this case it's not really needed. But it is 100k because the fridge door is closed, you're not going to ever see that. Uh, then comes the real oddity, there's a Zener diode. And I was thinking that uh, if that is a Zener diode, I can't really test it in circuit. I'd have to actually test it quite high voltage. Maybe just get a, a resistor and diode and capacitor and just put it across the mains just to see what sort of voltage appeared across it. But um, it had me thinking uh, that uh, the idea of this is presumably to cap the voltage if the LEDs go open circuit, because they normally clamp the voltage down. But uh, in this case, uh, that uh, for that Zener to be rated what it is, there's 15 LEDs, each with roughly 3 volts across them. It's going to be about 45 volts. For The, the Zener's going to have to be rated above that, maybe about 50 or 60 volts, which means that in the event of the LEDs going open circuit, that, res that Zener would get very, very hot. It's notable that it's not really showing signs of heat, but having said that, that if these had gone open circuit, but having said that, it, it's a fridge, so it wouldn't have been in heavy use if it was. <clears throat> but it made me suddenly think, what if you put two uh, diacs in series? Because then you'd have to exceed the combined voltage of the diacs, and as soon as you combine, say, exceed the voltage of the diac, it, it suddenly shunts, it switches on, and that would clamp the voltage down. I wonder what would happen in that instance. I wonder if it would then clamp the voltage down, then all the dissipation would be basically in the capacitor with no heat. That might be an interesting safety device. After that comes the smoothing capacitor, which is an electrolytic. And it's rated, um, this is it here, it's looking slightly oval. I think it's had a bad experience in the postal system. And it's rated 63 volts, 100 microfarad, 100 microfarad, 63 volts. And then there's a 100 ohm resistor, tiny little surface mount resistor here, 101, 10 and 10, 100 ohms, uh, and then 15 LEDs, which I'm not going to draw 15 LEDs, that would take a considerable length of time. So, times 15. Oh, 100 ohm, or 100 R. So that's the circuit. It's very simple, it's very straightforward. Now, <coughs> If you were to have one of these that had gone faulty, um, I would the first thing I'd look for is whether one of the LEDs had the black spot of death. You know what it looks like. You get a little black dot because the uh, the junction is burnt out. and the uh, I wouldn't say necessarily the LED junction itself, but perhaps one of the bonds has failed, which is one of the most common problems. And then it starts arcing at that point. You get the wee black dot, and then it just burns open. And the, Initially, the lights will flicker, but then, they'll, uh, then it will go out completely. But the way to test the LEDs is very simple. If you have a meter, you can do this outside the unit without power. If you put your meter to continuity, let's see if I just, uh, this is going to swamp out afterwards. Oh, blimey, it's very dark, isn't it? Let's, uh, let's get a wee bit of light here. That's better. And if you uh, set it to continuity so it's got a slight leakage, uh, slight voltage across that, and then you were to go across each LED in turn, he said, probing about in the LED, hoping it was going to light up. I think I'll swap the lard here. And if you were to probe across each LED in turn, theoretically, it should light up to show it's good. And uh, I've been along all these LEDs, and uh, they all seem to be 
working okay. So I think the next thing we should try here and get ready for a super mega bright swamp of light. I think the next thing to try here is actually to connect it to the mains and see what happens. So let's get this out the way. Uh, let's get a couple of bits of wire and today I'm going to be using purple wire. So the first thing I'm going to do here to connect this up temporarily, I'm going to just go onto these connections here and I'm going to flow some nice juicy lead based solder onto this existing lead free stuff. Ross, reduction of hazardous substances. Mm -hmm. I often think, you know, given how little soda there is actually in modern circuit boards, I think the Ross initiative of getting lead out of soda was a disaster. It had the complete opposite effect. Because um, it made stuff so unreliable by making basically a brittle soda that is prone to failure. Particularly under the... You think of the ball grid array chips that you'd find in mobile phones and computers. And they've got these tiny little pellets of soda underneath and basically speaking, you heat the whole chip up and they just melt underneath and imagine this is a chip with all the pads underneath you just can't see the solder joints, you don't know how good they are and in the traditional lead based solder you'd have got a, a malleable joint that as the chip heated up and cooled down as they do, uh, modern chips still get quite warm uh, it would have um, had a slight give, it wouldn't have fractured in the same way the lead free stuff does but um, the quantity of lead involved, even if they were using it these days, would be tiny because you look at those chips, they use a minute quantity of soda. Where's my tester here? My power. Let's bring in the quick test. And it makes me think, you know, it's had the reverse effect because it's made stuff so unreliable. Um, I've, up, to the point that, oh, up to the point they switched to lead-free solda. I'd never had a computer or a laptop fail. At the point they switched across, I had loads of things going wrong, like laptops. So let's, uh, that's a bit squeaky. Let's power it up. That is working. So that makes me wonder, is it an intermittent fault with the LED? Is it maybe one of the LEDs is failing? Or was it the switch that was faulty in the unit? Um, because that's a possibility. It was a new product. It could have been the switch was faulty. Um, but in the case that it, if it was... Um, if it was a faulty switch and they just routinely replaced all the components, as they often do, just because it's cheaper if the service engineer goes out and changes a circuit board that costs oh, probably about a pound uh, to them, if that, uh, they won't sell you it for a pound, obviously. But uh, it's cheaper just to say, have one visit, because the major factor here is the, the uh, time of the person, the actual wages of the person coming out. So they'll probably just change everything. They'll change the lamp and they'll change the switch. But if the LED had failed in it, um, then you might see that black dot of death, but if you didn't and you used the meter to actually trace down through them, then what you could do to actually get the thing running again, and it's what I've shown in other videos as well, you could just say it was this one that had failed, you could get a little bit of wire and just tack across it. And in this case, because this is running very light duty and it's running cold because it's in a fridge and it's only brief periods of time, that would be an acceptable fix. It would mean a slightly higher current through these other LEDs. Talking of the current, what sort of current are these running at? It didn't look mega bright. Let's turn this to DC current. I'm going to set it to 200 milliamps. I'm going to take that lead out of there, put it in there. <clears throat> I'm going to power this up again. And then I'm going to probe across... Oh, that is quite squeaky, isn't it? That's because I... Uh, uh, got this uh, from a company I used to work for and it was like the, the pins had been damaged uh, with just excess use at the time and uh, I changed it for something completely inappropriate as one does so that's why it squeaks, they don't normally squeak like this I don't think they normally squeak like that so let's uh, keep in mind this is live at mains voltage let's uh, check that I've put it round to the right things and let's just short out the middle LED And the current is 25 milliamps. It's nothing really major, is it? It's pretty much running them as just standard LEDs, so they're not even hard pushed. <clears throat> if anything, it's, it's not going to be that mega bright, is it? Let's try and work out... Uh, there's 15 LEDs. <clears throat> so uh, each LED is dropping about 3 volts times approximately 0 0.025. So each one is approximately 0 0.075 watts times the... Uh, 15 
makes that a 1 watt LED, which is equivalent to a 10 watt lamp, which is probably close to a sort of pygmy lamp. I'm wondering how close. I'm going to plug that back in here and uh, I'm going to plug it into the power meter. Again, this is going to be, it's not going to be too accurate because it's the very sort of low end of the range. Uh, I could do with a more sensitive power meter actually. Let's plug it in and see what it says anyway. Drops plug on the floor. So it's lit, uh, it's saying about 1.8 watts and it's saying about 32 milliamps. Okay, not super mega accurate, but um, but it is agreeing with the sort of roughly... It says 1.8 watts, I, was, I, I would reckon that the actual dissipation of the LEDs is actually closer to... Um, well, let's measure the voltage across them. So I'm going to put the meter back to... You don't want to leave your meter in the uh, current setting when you do tests of voltage around that because it will basically pose a complete short circuit. So let's uh, measure the combined voltage. I was guessing probably round about 45 volts and I'll measure that across there. The electrolytic capacitor. Oh, that's quite footry. It's not quite not terribly easy. That is not easy at all, is it? That, that I'm f fumbling about uh, trying to see in the the bright light. It's showing about 48 volts when it's actually stable. Yeah, about 48 volts. So it's pretty close. I said uh, I reckon it was going to be 45. It is 48. So I'm um, close enough. So I'm um, just uh, off the. So let's, what was that? I, I said roughly about 25 milliamps, 0 0.025 times the 48 volts equals 1.2 watts. So yeah, hmm, I'd still say it's, it's roughly a one watt sort of panel. But yeah, it's interesting to see. Interesting to see a sort of generic module. Uh, I wonder how much they actually sell the replacements for. I'd probably say 10, 15 pounds, just because, well, because they can, because you need one, because you can't put the ordinary lamp in. So yeah, that was interesting to take a look at, but I'm guessing this instance, unless it was an intermittent problem, I'm guessing it was probably the switch in the fridge that was the faulty bit.